session. And we have a very interesting session, anterior segment surgery in the pediatric eye. And we are fortunate to have some really uh, good faculty who will uh, share some very important surgical pearls and uh, other important management related pearls to these uh, difficult pediatric eyes, which are difficult and different in many ways. Uh, they are uh, not just surgically challenging, but also post-operative care uh, that is required for such patients is uh, very different. So we've stuck to anterior segment surgeries in this particular um, uh, course. We have uh, Dr. Vinay Pillai from Kerala who will be telling us about um, the basics of uh, pediatric anatomy and embryology and will later also um, talk about ocular surface uh, disease in uh, surgery in pediatric eyes. Um, his, that's his special interest. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Devinder Sood from Delhi and he will be um, talking to us about pediatric glaucoma surgery. He has a lot of experience in that. And in fact, he's probably one of the few people in the country who have uh, isolated glaucoma practice without doing cataract. So kudos for that. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Rajesh Pogla, uh, one of the senior most cornea specialists uh, in the country and uh, world renowned um, cornea specialists. He will uh, show us his beautiful videos on how to do endothelial keratoplasty in uh, pediatric endothelial dystrophies. And uh, we have Dr. Murlidhar Ramappa, who is uh, the head of pediatric cornea at LV Prasad Eye Institute. And he will be talking to us about pediatric DALC and will share some of his uh, special pearls uh, on that subject. Finally, I will also be talking to you on pediatric cataract and will just show some surgical videos which will ho hopefully make the surgery easy for you. So without uh, further ado, uh, I think we can get started. I'd request the first speaker, Dr. Vinay Pillay, to tell us about the functional anatomy and embryology of the pediatric anterior segment. I request Dr. Fogla and Dr. Sue to join. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Rishi. A special thanks for the, you know, <coughs> topic it was a real challenging <laughs> experience to go back to your basic a anatomy and embryology to relearn things which you have you know which you realize you have forgotten over the years <coughs> now when we think about uh, embryology or when we talk about embryology as expected it starts from the uh, you know fertilization <coughs> uh, the the ovum and the sperm fuses usually occurs in the fallopian tube and as it migrates, you know, by the time it reaches the uterine cavity, the blastocyst cyst stage, which implants onto the uterine wall. <coughs> the inner cell mass uh, first differentiates to ki give the, you know, bilamina uh, germ dust, then the trilamina, where you have the ectoderm, mesoderm, and the endoderm. And then by uh, day 22, that is a day when you first see or is able to recognize the developing eye, the optic sulci, sulci which is on the either side of the <coughs> neural groove with the neural uh, folds on either side. This neural folds uh, fuse together to, fall <coughs> to form the neural tube and the you know, fusion starts at the center and extends caudally and rostrally. Now, the optic sulci then extends or forms uh, diverticula or outpouching to form uh, the bulbous optic vesicle and the optic stalk. Corresponding to the surface of the optic vesicle, on the surface ectoderm, you have the thickening which forms the lens placard. Then uh, the optic vesicle invaginates. This invaginates is asymmetrical, which is, uh, results in the formation of the you know, choroidal fissure. And it is through this choroidal fissure, the hyaloid and the mesenchyme gains access into the developing eye. <coughs> As the invaginates, uh, invagination of optic uh, cup uh, progresses, the lens placard also invaginates, forming the lens vesicle with the lens pick. And, and by, yeah, and, and, and the, the importance of choroidal fissure, as we all know, is the, uh, you know, uh, uh, formation of uh, what, what we call as coloboma. 
the optic again uh, like the uh, neural tube the choroidal fissure also fuses first in the center and then extends both outwards and inwards and if if it fails to fuse it results in iris choroidal or ciliary body colobomas <coughs> now uh, by by the fifth week the lens vesicle has fused and has migrated inside the surface ectoderm is complete or single layer which forms a future uh, you know corneal epithelium <coughs> uh, the the sing single cellular layer of the uh, vesicles come together because of the deepening of the optic vesicle and these are the future uh, retinal layers <coughs> By day, day 39, we have what we have, what we call as the first wave of the mesenchyme, which passes from the rim of the optic cup directly beneath the surface ectoderm and forms the, and this forms the, uh, you know, future endothelium of the cornea and the trabecular meshwork. Then, by uh, <coughs> uh, seventh week, the, you know, the lens starts forming in the sense the posterior epithelium of the lens elongates into the you know, the primary lens fibers, the vesicle, uh, the space obliterates, the potential sub uh, or the space of the optic vesicle also obliterates, resulting in the fusion, because of the fusion of the both layers of the epithelial layer of the <coughs> vesicle. The mesoderm surrounding the uh, optic vesicle starts to condense. The outer layer of this mesenchyme forms the sclera and the inner loose vascular layer results in the future choroid. At the same time, you get the, you know, the surface ectoderm forms into folds, which is the early uh, uh, lids. <coughs> and again, by day 49, you get the second wave of the mesenchyme, and this uh, forms the keratocytes or leads to formation of keratocytes, which leads on the rest of the corneal stroma. And problems with the keratocytes or what the, the what the pre precursors known as keratoblasts can result in, you know, corneal opacities like. Peter's anomalies and other congenital opacities. <coughs> so by eighth week, uh, the structure is reasonably well formed. Uh, the ganglion cell sends or sends the uh, 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 axons through the optic stalk to form the optic nerve. Uh, the lens is uh, developing. Then, you know, the lids. Uh, folds grow and fuse together with the potential conjunctival space underneath it and it, the progresses. You have the third mesenchyme after this, which results in the formation of the, you know, the iris and the substance of the trabecular meshwork. So, and the uh, process continues and the, at birth, almost the, you know, 80% of the adult size is attained. Postnatal, there is a rapid increase in size during the first year. Then it gradually slows down and probably increases in size again during puberty. The cornea is supposed to reach the adult size by two years of age. Pigmentation of the iris stroma occurs during the first year, and as we all know, the lens grows throughout the life of a person. <coughs> so in short, you know, the embryogenesis consists of a series of steps that build on one another. Each step creates a ripple effect on subsequent steps and the whole thing is regulated by genetic programs that are activated in specific cell types and in a specific order, which consists of cascades of genes that are expressed in response to external cues. Now, how exactly the whole this whole process happens is still not very clear, and we know, you know, the the, the specialty of fetal medicine has evolved because of you know uh, the research that is happening on these aspects. So it is a quite a complex uh, uh, procedure process happening, which we still are not very clear about. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay. Uh, I think that's a good way to start uh, nicely like this. Uh, the next important talk is on pediatric glaucoma surgery. What, when, how? And um, Dr. David Isood was a uh, large body of work in this area will share to us his experience with this surgery. So I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to be here. Not moving.
do it from my laptop directly? It's not moving. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, glaucoma at birth accounts for about one in 10,000 live births. It is rare for an ophthalmologist to see the entire spectrum and that to all large numbers. Different people have uh, classified uh, congenital glaucomas differently, but if you look at it, it's broadly developmental glaucomas and it includes the primary congenital variety where there is no associated ocular or systemic anomaly. Then you have the developmental glaucomas where there is an associated ocular or systemic anomaly. The con in primary congenital glaucoma, the maldevelopment of the trabecular meshwork accounts for the rise in intraocular pressure. Based on a modification of Quitco and Morin, the RP Center group in 1984 had described uh, the clinical features and classification to be followed in India, which, which gave us an idea to the management and also a guide to the prognosis. Uh, this included uh, the newborn variety, which was present from birth to one year, and the classical triad of blepharospasm, photophobia, and watering was absent. Then you had the infantile variety from four weeks to three years of age. The classical triad of blepharospasm, photophobia, and watering was present. And then you had the juvenile type, where to which was not unlike the open angle glaucoma type. And so this is the front on view of the eye of a newborn. You find that the mesodermal tissue adjacent to the uh, pupil is not developed all the way up to the uh, periphery, creating black triangles surrounded by vascular pillars where iridial blood vessels actually tend to run. These are again to show you different forms of developmental glaucoma, Sturge Weber, Neva Sopota, Axenfield Rieger syndrome, Aniridia, Peters, and various forms of iridocornal endothelial syndromes. Gonioscopically, in, the, in congenital glaucoma, there are two variants that we see. There is a high insertion of the iris, and the other part is there can be an incomplete separation of the iris. Primary congenital glaucoma is a surgical entity. Medical treatment has a role only till the time you are able to prepare the child for surgery or if the intraocular pressure increases after the surgery has been done. Early surgery is de desirable before the Schlenz canal is obliterated, the corneal clarity is getting affected because if the intraocular pressure increases, the optic nerve is also going to get changes. We have several surgical options. Let's look at them uh, individually. Goniotomy was first introduced by D. Vincentis, but is attributed to Barkins because he combined it with the use of gonio lenses. The procedure over the years has remained the same, where you enter the uh, anterior chamber through a corneal incision, go all the way up to the opposite end, and you slice through the iris tissue that you see here, 100 to 110 degrees. The use of, uh, so the success rate was, uh, was found to be very effective in about 80% of cases. Even Schaeffer's uh, success rates were very good. Surprisingly, the results of goniotomy are not good when the glaucoma and the glaucoma surgery is done within a, a month of birth or after two years. Clear cornea is one of the prerequisites to doing a good goniotomy. The use of viscoelastics to facilitate a safe passage across the anterior chamber, gonio lenses and surgical microscopes have enhanced surgical outcomes. You can use pilocarpine before and after the surgery. Even an endoscopic goniotomy has now been tried. But I think the biggest limitation in Indian uh, scenario is the fact that most of our patients present with cloudy corneas and that uh, decreases the success rate or the viability of doing a good goniotomy. Trabeclectomy was first described by Burian where he, uh, through a radial incision, de roof Schlem's canal using a trabecular tome. Harms added to this by creating a superficial triangular flap and then uh, de roofing Schlem's canal. The use of pilocarpin before and after helped increase the success of the surgery. Even sutures have been tried to de roof Schlem's canal. The advantage of the uh, trabeclotomy ab externo is that it can be done even in the presence of a corneal opacity. Trabeclectomy has also been tried. The conventional trabeclectomy that, that we do uh, combined with mitomycin, releasable sutures have all been tried in uh, these glaucomas. 
people have tried to combine trabeculotomy where you have the advantage of getting the aqu uh, aqueous in the anterior chamber to gain access to the Schlem's canal and have a backup by doing a trabeculectomy where you get the uh, aqueous to get into the subconjunctival space. So you try to create two out outflow passages for the uh, aqueous to flow out. Trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy ab externo combined were first described in an eye with where the goniotomy had failed. The RP center group since 1970 had been trying out various surgical procedures and were not very happy with the outcomes they were getting. The initial results with goniotomy, gonio puncture, sheath and all were very good in the initial post-op period, but then the intraocular pressures were beginning to increase. And that's when they even looked at trabeculectomy. Till the time they combined the trabeculotomy ab externo with the trabeculectomy. So here you can see they've raised a triangular flap, a deep scleral block is marked, and just anterior to the scleral spur is Schlem's canal, which can actually be uh, cannulated with the Harms trabeculotome. So what they observed was in 19 eyes that 17 eyes, the intraocular pressure was well controlled for a period of 12, uh, for, for a period of two years without any medication, leading them to uh, conclude that the combined procedure was safe and effective in controlling intraocular pressure in congenital glaucoma. Since then, more or less, the primary, tra uh, the trabeculotomy ab externo with tra trabeculectomy has been the norm for primary congenital glaucoma in India. Dr. Mandel, Mandel the LB Pasad uh, people have only popularized the combined procedure over the years. We recently published an eye, the long-term outcome of a single surgeon, uh, where we took uh, 230 eyes from 121 patients who had been followed up for a minimum period of 20 years. 172 eyes had newborn glaucoma and 58 had infantile glaucoma. And uh, a com success was achieved in uh, at least 73% of the eyes with additional surgical intervention required only in about 18% of the eyes at last follow-up of about a mean follow-up of 29 years. We also found that the probability of success IOP-wise was 95% till 25 years, 90% at 27 years, going down to 68% at 30 years respectively. Visual acuity is a very important criteria because Anderson in the earlier part of the century had said that children with congenital glaucoma can be safely put in a blind institution by the time they reach adolescence. This study shows the long-term outcome of uh, the combined procedure implying that uh, less than 30% of patients had a vision of, uh, less than 30% had a vision less than 20 by 200. And if we use the current WHO criteria, only 20%, only 20 patients at the last visit, about 12% had severe visual impairment and uh, were functionally blind. So that was the extent to what the combined procedure outcome were. Aqueous drainage devices have a definite role when your primary surgery has failed, maybe a trabeculectomy has also failed. The advantage, aqueous uh, drainage implants have fared better as compared to trabeculectomy with mitomycin as far as IOP lowering is concerned, but these have all, the, uh, the drainage implants have also required more reoperations for surgical complications. A wide variety of uh, choices is available, but it all boils down to the experience of the surgeon, the type of glaucoma, and the socioeconomic uh, environment. Commonly, the Ahmed, the Barwalt, and the Indian version, the Adi, are commonly being used. But then, many of these uh, uh, implants require resurgery for the co uh, complications that they produce, like uh, corneal decompensation, tube erosion and migration. In fact, uh, in children, hypotony, tube exposure, motility problems, and bleb encapsulation are much more common as compared to uh, adult eyes. Destructive procedures are actually reserved for situations where uh, you keep them for refractory pediatric glaucomas where eyes don't respond. The issue here is that uh, the titration of the intraocular pressure is difficult and also because the, super, the ciliary epithelium has the ability to regenerate, so multiple treatment sessions can be required. Cyclo destruction is difficult to do when uh, the, the transcleral diode laser is commonly used and is difficult to do, particularly in eyes which have thin sclera. There's always a fear of creating a perforation. And over a period of time, these scleral uh, laser application spots tend to thin out further. So these are the surgical operations. I've purposely missed out on non-penetrating uh, uh, surgeries because they do not provide adequate lowering of intraocular pressure. 
we are actually aiming for pressures close to 10 millimeters of mercury in these children for their lifetime. Operating in children is a challenge by itself because of the ophthalmic eye. The sclera is thin and uh, the limbus is enlarged and as a result of that, the anatomical landmarks are all distorted. They are prone to faster healing and uh, if a previous surgery has been done, that also needs to be kept in mind. Examining children is extremely difficult and, and therefore the outcome can at times be difficult to assess. A bophthalmic eye is, uh, they have low scleral rigidity and they're predisposed to complications of, eye, of a low IOP like a hypotenuse maculopathy, choroidal effusion, supracoroidal hemorrhages. Procedure specific wise in Indian eyes, a goniotomy is difficult to uh, perform usually because many of them present with cloudy corneas. The glaucoma when they present is fairly advanced and because of their late uh, presentation. In our study, we had 71% uh, of eyes uh, who, which presented with corneal clouding. Trabeculectomy, and therefore the same would apply to the combined procedure. The anatomical landmarks in a bophthalmic eye are difficult. The raising the superficial triangular uh, flap, whether triangular or rectangular, is difficult. And because of the thin sclera, you often tend to have a cheese wiring effect as you're suturing along. These eyes have uh, exaggerated healing response and uh, they are prone to, if you use mitomycin, you'll find that the blebs tend to thin out and have a tendency to leak over time. Same applies here. The difficulty to this procedure actually is that sometimes it is difficult to identify the Schlem's canal. This is a child. Remember, it's not glaucoma drainage, but aqueous drainage devices. Patient presented with two surgeries done earlier, superior nasal, inferior temporal, uh, inferior nasal staphylomas. A first tube was done, followed by a second tube, as you see here. So uh, glaucoma accounts for one in 10,000 life births. An average life expectancy is 90 year so you actually need three generation of ophthalmologists to take care of one child. Glaucoma surgery in Indian in, in pediatric eyes is challenging and uh, remember that congenital glaucoma is a surgical disease. The first surgery usually carries the best success rate. Trabeculectomy, ab externo with trabe trabeculotomy with trabeculectomy is the first preferred choice and then these are additional choices that you could look for repeat surgeries. It doesn't end with a good surgery. Children need to be followed up and treated vigorously for simple things like an amblyopia. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk, uh, Dr. Sood. Uh, can we just have a couple of questions? Does anybody have questions for Dr. Sood? Uh, I have a question. So suppose uh, how early or what is the youngest child that you have done a pediatric glaucoma surgery for? Two days. Two days. Wow. The difficulty in age group now is that in, I'm in a private setup. I'm in a standalone glaucoma clinic. So anesthetists today are very wary of giving anesthesia to small children. So in the last two years, I have not done a child less than one year because the anesthetist is not willing. The next talk is on uh, pediatric cataract surgery and I'll just uh, be sharing my experience with that. I think all of us uh, see pediatric cataracts uh, in our clinic and we know that not everybody should venture into pediatric cataract surgery without being a very good anti-segment cataract surgeon uh, first because these are uh, difficult cataracts. Uh, the nucleus is not difficult but everything else is difficult. And if you don't, if you have, uh, the slides are not advancing. If the things don't turn out the way you have planned, then you can have disastrous consequences. Okay. Yeah, so there are several considerations. Uh, first is uh, whether it's a unilateral versus a bilateral cataract because that will have implications on when you're going to operate. If it's a bilaterally symmetric cataract, you can buy some time before you intervene. But if it's a unilateral cataract, 
you know it's going to be at risk for amblyopia, so you want to intervene as soon as possible. Again, uh, the decision regarding IOL placement, if the fellow eye is phakic, then you want to try and make this uh, cataractus eye pseudophakic uh, rather than aphakic, um, which lends to use uh, whether to do under correction. Again, uh, in a bilateral cataract, uh, it may be okay to, uh, it would probably be advisable to under correct. But if it's a unilateral cataract, then you don't want to make the cataract aside too hyperopic because that again is amblyogenic, so that's debatable. And again, if it's a unilateral cataract, uh, sometimes you may not need to do uh, systemic investigations. It could uh, just be an idiopathic dissing. But if it's bilateral, then uh, it would be recommended that you send to a pediatrician to investigate for the cause. Uh, one of the important considerations in any pediatric surgery, not just cataract, is the GA considerations, uh, especially when you're going to be operating two eyes of a child, uh, whether one should be giving administering GA twice or should one do uh, sequential bilateral surgery under the same general anesthesia. So there are two schools of thought, but there has been a lot of talk lately that it may make sense to actually do both surgeries in the same setting, uh, one after the other. Of course, you make sure everything is different, including the batch of intraocular solution that you use and uh, a completely new trolley, etc. Uh, which anesthesia to use? Uh, uh, again, I think all of us are using different uh, agents. Um, in our uh, practice, predominantly, we use a laryngeal mask, uh, but sometimes we even operate under ketamine. Uh, we, but we have to be mindful of the effect of that on the intraocular pressure. Um, by and large, because cataract surgery is not very long, uh, laryngeal mask does work, but if uh, you think it's going to take longer time, better to do an endotracheal intubation. Um, there are various surgical considerations, um, where to make the incision, how uh, large should it be, should one suture it. Um, anterior capsulotomy is different from an adult eye. We know that these uh, uh, capsules are elastic and their excess tends to run. Uh, Many of these children require a posterior capsulotomy, especially if they are under uh, eight years of age. I like to do a primary posterior capsulotomy along with an anterior vitrectomy. Otherwise, we know that they have 100% PCO. Beyond eight, you can yag it, so that it may not be that necessary. And of course, when to put the lens. Uh, in my practice, I put an intraocular lens if, if the child is older than one year. But there are uh, several of uh, us who are using uh, IOLs even for younger children. Uh, it's important that you use a high density viscoelastic, uh, not just uh, HPMC because uh, HPMC tends to come out of the paracentesis very soon. So it, uh, it will be recommended that you use uh, sodium hyaluronate or uh, some dense viscoelastic um, of, a, of a higher concentration so that it keeps the anterior chamber formed at all times and keeps the capsule flattened. Basically, if the capsule is flattened, there will be a lesser chance of your excess running out. Uh, the anterior capsulotomy is best done with a microrexis forceps uh, rather than with a needle because uh, with a needle sometimes it tends to run out and you will need the pull to be centripetal which is sometimes difficult to do with a needle. So if you have a forceps, whether you use a, a micro forceps like this or you could even use a utrata through a main wound, uh, the force is centripetal as you can see here and also slightly anterior towards the center of the cornea. And if you use this kind of a force, usually you're able to control the size of the rexis. So you can see even though you're pulling centripetally, it ends up becoming uh, fairly large. You have to, of course, like in any uh, forceps rexis, you have to mul multiple times you have to re-grasp. And uh, because you're using a high density viscoelastic, there's very little escape of the OVD and the anterior chamber remains stable. So everything is a lot more controlled. Um, the sizing, uh, ideally the uh, anterior CC should be just short of the uh, size of your um, optic of your intraocular lens which you're planning to use. Uh, other than this, you could also use a vitrector. A lot of people use a vitrectomy machine to make the anterior capsulotomy. That's perfectly fine, but you have to ensure that you have a, 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 a form bag and it, you don't have you don't lose the excess. Um, posterior capsulotomy. Uh, of, uh, is another thing that we need to use in many of these patients and uh, the size of this should of course be smaller than your anterior capsulotomy. Uh, you don't want the lens falling in through that. So it should be large enough to allow light to pass into the eye and should be well centered 
but if it's too large then sometimes you may have uh, problems of placing the lens uh, some people like to do the posterior capsulotomy after putting the intraocular lens uh, by using a vitrectomy uh, i like to do make a primary capsulotomy uh, in this manner so make a little nick in the um, uh, posterior capsule as you can see here you can use a needle for that put some viscoelastic uh, to push the antivitreous phase back and then you, you grasp the capsule with a um, uh, microrexis forceps and again using a centripetal and anterior force you make a posterior capsulotomy. The posterior capsulotomy is actually a lot easier than an anterior capsulotomy because it's smaller and essentially all your force is kind of uh, uh, directed centripetally. So very rare that you will actually end up losing a posterior capsulotomy. You may disturb the vitreous but uh, most of the time you are able to con complete that circle. And um, uh, like I said, some people like to do it afterwards. You can use a vitrector to do it. After putting the lens, you can go around the IOL and do it. You could even go past planar and make the opening in the posterior capsule. Uh, posterior capsule. All are fairly okay and um, it doesn't really matter as long as you get an intact posterior capsulotomy. Uh, lately, I've been, I have the Zepto and I've been using the Zepto to make uh, capsulotomies and I found that this is a very useful instrument uh, because you get a perfect round rexis of a proper size uh, which sometimes is difficult to do in a pediatric eye. So the anterior capsulotomy comes out really good. Um, I like to use a high density viscoelastic uh, when I'm doing uh, a Zepto in pediatric eyes. So this basically is a device which catches onto the anterior capsule with uh, using a suction cup and this has this metallic ring called a nitinol ring which delivers a shock of current which basically makes a hole in, in, in your anterior capsule and you can see you get a perfect round axis like that. It, it has these little fibers attached to the border which are basically coagulated uh, protein from the uh, collagen from the uh, capsule. And then, of course, the rest of the surgery is as usual. The posterior capsulotomy, currently, you have to still do manually, but uh, it is under development, a, uh, a handpiece for that using the Zepto. So that should be interesting. So again, just showing that how putting the viscoelastic there pushes the vitreous back. And uh, I, I find this a very useful thing when you're doing the posterior capsulotomy. And a good red glow, of course, makes visibility of that posterior capsule very, very easy. And you can see a well-centered uh, round posterior capsulotomy uh, that, of course, will result in a good outcome. So the Zepto is now coming with this kind of a handpiece which can go into the bag. It's a smaller sized handpiece which can give you a smaller PCCC. Of course, we'll have to see how uh, clumsy or easy it is to do uh, to introduce this into the bag and do it uh, without causing too much uh, damage to the zonules. So you can see uh, that's the edge of your zeptorexis, perfectly round. And um, you could use a femto, but then you would have to give, uh, uh, you would, the child would be under GSO. How would you shift him from the, the femto table to the um, uh, operating table, unless you have got a Zima machine? Um, anterior vitrectomy is uh, something I have to I do in every case of where I do a posterior capsulotomy and I think it's an important step because otherwise the anterior vitreous phase works like a scaffold for the posterior capsular opacification and all the lens epithelial cells grow on that and form a sheet. So you can use uh, diluted triamcinolone to stay in the vitreous if you like otherwise you can just um, directly go ahead and do the vitrectomy. The principles of vitrectomy are the same as uh, in any other surgery. Um, higher cut rate than vacuum and um, make sure that you clear the entire posterior capsule of any vitreous. So you'll have to go behind and, and direct the port upward and uh, kind of complete your post uh, anterior vitrectomy. Pass planar vitrectomy is also a reasonable uh, option and many people prefer to do that. Uh, you could use the smaller gauge vitrectomy uh, cutters now which are available now 23, 25 etc. So you can also, like I said, go after putting the lens around the IOL and do it. Um, both are okay, but sometimes in this, it may be a little uncontrolled and you may risk having a larger uh, or an extension of your posterior capsulotomy, which is not desirable. Uh, 
Uh, of course, if you're not putting a lens, then through your side port itself, you can go ahead and do the vitrectomy and uh, even the posterior capsulotomy can be done with the cutter itself, uh, which is fairly okay. Which lens to use is again um, um, something one has to think about. Single piece lenses are okay, but uh, PMMA lenses, if they're very large, they can press on the angle and cause glaucoma. So you want to use a single piece hydrophobic lens. Three piece lenses again are a very good choice, especially if you're not sure whether you'll be able to get a perfect posterior capsulotomy, you can put them in the sulcus and then capture the optic behind the rexis and that works really well. Um, I'll just go through these. So uh, acrylic material is preferable uh, over PMMA and hydrophobic material is preferable over uh, um, hydrophilic and that's those are results of an APOS survey which was conducted in September 2007. Predominantly people prefer hydrophobic lenses as you can see both for uh, bag and sulcus placement. Toric IOLs is a bit controversial. We know that the pediatric cornea keeps changing its uh, shape till uh, much later. So unless the astigmatism is very high and you just want to kind of reduce it, uh, I would not recommend using toric IOLs in pediatric eyes. Uh, there are other newer lenses like the bag in the lens, which has been uh, popularized by Mary Tessianon and you have these light adjustable IOLs whose power can be adjusted after surgery which may be useful, uh, but unfortunately they're not available in India. I'd like to just close with this important point. All pediatric cataracts, we must suture the wound, even if they're perfectly sealed on table, because these children tend to rub their eyes, they have in injuries, and um, you really will regret it if you don't put a suture sometimes. So even though it means that you might have to go back under anesthesia to take out the suture, it's worth it. Always suture, not just your main wound, even your side ports uh, in pediatric cataracts. And don't forget the aftercare. The surgery is not the end of the management. There's a lot, long journey after that. Amblyopia needs to be managed. These patients often go on to develop high myopia. Uh, possibly dilute atropine, which is being uh, used for control of myopia, may have a role here to reduce the uh, myopic shift that they have. Visual rehabilitation uh, using the appropriate contact lenses or glasses monitoring the intraocular pressure, EUAs periodically, and suture removal at appropriate time is important. Thank you. The next talk is by Dr. Murlidhar Ramapa. Uh, he is a brilliant cornea, pediatric cornea surgeon from LB Prasad Eye Institute, and possibly one of the few people uh, in our country who has got a fellowship in pediatric, pediatric cornea. He will uh, share to us some tips about doing DALC in these small eyes. Very good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rishi, for the kind words and also for inviting me to present my work here. for the technical glitch. So I shall be sharing some of the clinical pearls, particularly anterior lamella keratoplasty in children. I do not have any financial interest relationship pertinent to this particular talk. You see here a very typical case of golden art, which has 30% 30 30 of them do have a bilateral involvement. So not only it is costless, it does affect the vision and also extraocular motility. So this child elsewhere had a simple excision. This has resulted in a dense panis, which is uh, encroaching on the visual axis, and it is also producing a cosmesis blinus. And uh, this child has a challenge to operate otherwise. So this is a surgical video. So although at times it looks very simple, and uh, believe me, this particular condition at times unforgiving because they have a propensity to develop eye complications because you have an underlying large dermal lipoma which is hidden, we may not know at times. So my part is not only once excise your derma in total, then you are ready, your bed is ready for a LK. Uh, this particular instance, you know, I have to go for a little decentered large diameter LK 
because you know it is approaching the visual axis. If I do a patch lamella graft, my stitches come in the visual axis, so I end up having a poor functional outcome. So also fact that you know we need to make sure you preserve at least two third of the limbus. Uh, you can see actually one third you do not have a limbus. That was you know the way the limbus on the limbus the dermoid was straddling. And it's very important to ensure rest of the limbus is functionally good, intact, which helps in maintaining the epithelial viability. So I don't intend to go very deep here. Even if 80% thickness, if I get a uniform plane without much debris in the interface, that would be my goal in these cases. And when we do histopath, it is a complex choreostoma. At times, you have even a salivary gland, cartilage, and so on. So this child did have a very good outcome following intervention. And it's very, very important because, you know, the tissue is exposed. Although it is a lamellar tissue, I would keep the steroid postoperatively similar to an APK because this can have a IO propensity for a allograft rejection, like a stromal rejection, then end up having a very bad interface vascularization that would actually limit the functional outcome. So early suture removal and a long-term steroid is a key again here. I'm sorry, it's a reversal, thank you. So the dermat can have a very good outcome if you can actually look at this particular case following the suture removal after a three year as a very decent graft interface is pristine clear. And a small, smaller dermat, I did do the, you know, the direct paired a comparison with a simple excision versus a patch graft. I think patch graft works very well. It gives a much better cosmosis. One of the reason behind this anterior stroma supposed to have some niche elements which helps in a normal propagation of your epithelium and restoration of the limbus, thereby it will prevent the unnecessary pseudoterysium formation onto the cornea. So we'll go on to the next uh, scenario it's a mucopolysaccharidosis exceedingly rare and a small subset of cases they do have a good cognitive function wherein we can actually resort to it all so this is a very granular looking at times it may mimic something like a chcd one of the important signs to watch here you have a predominantly granular like grayish opacification you don't have any bullies so which is very very noticeable in a ched case when we actually look at and rest your intraocular pressure, white to white damage or everything would be normal in these cases. Uh, you could actually go ahead and do a lamellar here again. I wouldn't recommend a big bubble. The reason is the glycosaminoglycans which are deposited aberrantly within the corneal lamellae, it prevents the air percolation. So you don't end up having a good successful big bubble in these instances. I had a many failed bubble in these cases and uh, stop doing a big bubble in these cases. And uh, once you have a failed, about 70 to 80%, if your stromal bed is a pristine clear, so that's your end point, uh, can achieve a decent outcome. The reason is in these cases, you can't even intubate, as the Dr. Sood was alluding, you know, anesthetists may not be very cooperative to induce these cases and uh, LMA can actually work where you're not even entering anterior chamber. It will give a very decent outcome. Although it is a light limiting disease, typically, you know, what histopathological studies have shown, eventually glycosaminoglycans does damage the endothelium, but this endothelium has been estimated to stay at least for a 40 years. I think for the lifetime of the MPS case, the DALC should work in these cases. There again, entitical corneal keloid, which comes with uh, various systemic diseases. You have a very gelatinous flock-like lesion, which is straddling the visual axis. You can actually at times feel it. So it's mainly aberrant response from your anterior stroma. So once you feel that one, you can actually try attempt big bubble. Even if you have failed your bubble, doesn't matter. And we don't need to decimate bear in these children. One of the biggest advantage of pre-decimatic DALC is it's easily repeatable. Even in event, you know, they end up having an infection or rejection. It's easy to tackle these cases. And which comes in a various format. This was a, the first case was a 
purely in a fibrous component. The second one has an intense vascularity. We term it as a fibrous fanus. So again, you know, it's an opaque cornea where a big bubble visibility may not be easier here. Again, a manual dissection. Either you could use a microkeratome or a manual dissection actually gives a good results. And one of the biggest concern is if you leave behind enough stroma, they may have a recurrence. This is the one uh, typical corneal dermoid, which I showed you limbal. This is a classic corneal dermoid. So even a dolk is possible. UBM is a key ear. So if you do not have any intraocular extension, you can debulk the entire dermoid. I'm sorry about the video quality is the poor here. I actually made a bookmark for my video, which all sections, so it's not visible, unfortunately, here. So essentially, I've used the hydro delamination technique here. Once I debulk completely, I'll just show you in this particular video where I hope I'll, yes, I get a, something when you have a partial bubble, so you can actually use either viscoelastic or a fluid so to expand your bubble and it will go and expand in a pre-desmetic plane and you can have a successful dolk here. So I prefer to have a pre-desmetic dolk in pediatric case group. It's very easier and even a separation may be much difficult to get in this age group and you have a lesser chance or a risk of having a potential perforation. This is other child who had uh, Lyme retained within the stroma. Not only it is affecting his vision and the cosmosis, so this has been there for about six years. And uh, what I did is here, he needed an eccentric graft. This video is not running, so I did use a femto here to dissect out carefully and postoperatively. This is what. And what was surprising, despite this line was staying for a significant amount of time, the endothelium was absolutely fine. The specular showed a good outcome. The OCT, you can actually see the lime soap, which is occupying almost 50% of the corneal stroma. And this is following, a, again, a doll called the cornea is a much thicker ear, has got a very good outcome. So here again, you know, the part of the limbus is also involved. So since you know though you have a more than two third of the limb was pretty good, so this child did not develop any stem cell deficiency postoperatively. And I'm coming to one more case series where uh, the keratoglobus, unfortunately, most of these cases by rule, by age of 10 years, they lose both eye. So these are the brittle corneas. You have a blue sclera, even a sclera is extremely thin here. So here the steps are here to do a good peritomy and make sure we've removed epithelium completely. The epithelial downgrowth or ingrowth is one of the devastating complications in these cases. This child already had a prior you know, trauma which we repaired about six months prior to attempting this particular procedure. So once you preserve the recipient epithelium and the limbus, then you make a groove and GRU has to be very, very diligently. You can have an inadvertent perforation. And once you make this pocket all around, then you can tuck in your donor tissue. So you're basically you know, adding the tissue. It's a basically a preparatory procedure for a future central keratoplasty. In a certain instances, child do recover. recover. You know, the, if there is a small island of a cornea clear, they do have a, some good functional vision, regain. And one of the biggest problem I face in these cases is uh, interface epithelial down growth, vascularization. A couple of cases I had a stromal rejection. And in, in spite of this, you know, the sclera can rupture in these cases. At least, to, you know, they delay their uh, site threatening complication in these cases. You can just postpone as much as possible. These are the some of the post-operative picture. You can actually see the OCT. It's about barely 260 micron. So after adding tissue, it's little 
closer to the 550 microns. So the child is doing well even after three years. And uh, some of the HSV keratitis, some of the congenital herpes wherein you can even attempt a doll can have a good results. This was a child who referred from uh, Abu Dhabi who had a contact lens related infection, six year old child. And this has been there for the last three months. You can see the amount. I, I is looking very angry and intense vascularization. So initially did the debulking, took out the significant part of the cornea which had a stromal infiltrate. Should be able to finish in a month, minute. And I was hesitant to, you know, do the big bubble and a big bubble in this case. And one of the trick in a acanthomy bite has to be dismet bearing. The reason is if you leave behind any amount of residual stroma, your cyst can retain. Once you start the steroids, they get reactivated. So that's a one of the important risk for the recurrence. So the rule is whenever you do an acanthomy bar, so try get the dismet bearing. So that will actually maximize your clinical success. This same child, since you know this uh, infiltrate was lying for a long time, I believe underlying endothelium may not be clear. It, it took nearly six weeks for uh, Desmets to clear completely, and he finished about 11 years follow up. He has a 20-30 vision, and uh, these are the uh, though no financial disclosure. These are the very thoughtfully brilliant instruments. So this use of this instruments has made my surgery much more safer and predictable. Thanks to Dr. Fogla. You have uh, many such instruments available. So with this, I conclude my talk. If there are any talks, I'll be more than happy to. Thank you, Dr. Rishi, again. Wonderful uh, talk, uh, Murli. I, th I think you showed some really nice videos, and that was the purpose of this uh, course. Um, I think uh, DALC has come as a boon for especially pediatric patients because many of these opacities, which the endothelium is healthy, we were unnecessarily sacrificing the endothelium. and um, uh, DALC has really uh, come as a very, very big boon for them because, uh, uh, again, the chance of rejection comes down. You can take out sutures earlier and uh, overall outcome is much better. I have um, one child with keratoglobus who had a penetrating keratoplasty, large diameter, um, who lost his eye and I did a large diameter LK in his eye. The LK eyes is, is seeing 20-30 and I feel every time I see that patient, I feel reinforced that yes, uh, thank God for DALC. Okay, so we'll move on to the next talk, uh, uh, none other than, than Dr. Uh, Rajesh Fogla, who will be uh, sharing his surgical videos on doing endothelial keratoplasty uh, in um, endothelial disorders in children. Uh, he's a master surgeon and um, my teacher, and I'm sure he will also show us how we can do DMEC uh, in uh, conditions like CHED, which is uh, very, very challenging. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Rishi. The topic given is endothelial keratoplasty in congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy and posterior polymorphous dystrophy. I think you've done something to the aspect ratio. You've changed the aspect ratio. It's coming slightly compressed. That's OK. Uh, congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy, it's a rare corneal dystrophy. However, if there is uh, consanguinity in the family, then there is an increased incidence, maybe slightly much more in the Middle East than South in India. Presence as diffuse clouding of the cornea. It can have two types. It can present right from birth when it is supposed to be uh, chest type 2, which is autosomal recessive, or it can present gradually by one year of age when it is termed as chest type 1, or and it's autosomal dominant. And uh, in recent times, they are considering putting, clubbing this with posterior polymorphous dystrophy. There is thickened cornea and the thickened decimus membrane as well and paucity of endothelial cells as seen on confocal microscopy. There is a diffuse limbus to limbus uh, diffuse edema and it can often be confused with congenital glaucoma because there is, the cornea is quite thickened, the measurement of the IOP can be higher and a lot of times we see these patients where trabeculectomy has already been done. This just to see two clinical cases where you can see there is diffuse corneal edema then there is increased thickening of the cornea. And the other one, that's another of my cases where there is band-shaped keratopathy in addition to the chronic edema. 
In contrast, poly, uh, posterior polymorphous dystrophy is also a rare corneal dystrophy with autosomal dominant inheritance. It's usually asymptomatic and corneal edema need not be present in all cases. Uh, patients can also present with peripheral anterior sinicae, iris abnormalities, correctopia, elevated intraocular pressure, and often can be confused with ICE syndrome. The three possible patterns of presentation, you can have vesicle-like lesions, band lesions, and diffuse opacities. You see polymechanism and pleomorphism of the endothelial cell, especially lining the band. And confocal microscopy can be useful uh, to, add, to differentiate between uh, posterior polymorphous dystrophy and ICE syndrome. And if there is presence of corneal edema, then corneal transplantation can be performed. Just to show you one of the cases where you can see this snail track or the band uh, kind of appearance, and there is sometimes duplication of the decimus membrane with multi-layered endothelium. Now, in both these conditions, when you look at pediatric penetrating keratoplasty, it can be challenging. It's quite different from doing uh, an adult uh, penetrating keratoplasty. Number one, children have a higher rate of uh, graft rejection than adults, and because of the lower scleral rigidity, increased fibrin reaction, and positive vitreous pressure, performing surgery is always a challenge, and often, if you're not used to it, you may end up uh, having a spontaneous expulsion of the crystalline lens. These patients are difficult to examine in the outpatient department and often require frequent examination under an anesthesia. And if you place sutures, then sutures need to be managed appropriately. And if you don't manage the sutures, you can often uh, result in suture-related complications. And uh, because of the sutures, you also have to tackle the changing refractions with the suture removals. And, and that, again, plays a very important role when you're managing amblyopia. In contrast, endothelial keratoplasty has several advantages. The surgery is more controlled due to a closed anterior chamber. The absence of sutures result in a faster visual recovery and eliminates the need for suture management. And uh, recent studies have shown that uh, endothelial keratoplasty definitely has a lower risk of rejection compared to penetrating keratoplasty. And because of lesser induced astigmatism, maybe the management of amblyopia could be better. Uh, there, are, there are several studies that have shown uh, that you can perform both dissect and dissect successfully in CHED uh, and with good outcomes. And some of the studies have come out of uh, LV Prasad Eye Institute and this one study by Dr. Ramapa and Jatin Ashur, where they have compared, uh, you know, one eye, PK, and the other eye, dissect. Uh, and they have found that at one year, all the graphs were clear. In the DSEC group, the astigmatism was lower as expected and had faster stabilization of refraction. However, the advantage the PK uh, group had was that the graphs appeared much more clearer than the DSEC graph because the cloudy cornea did, the edema did settle down, but a slight haze was still present. Now, in terms of, we know that when you do DSEC in these eyes, stripping of the decimus can be a major issue, especially if you're doing it in very young uh, children below the age of one year. So Busin and colleagues did publish a paper where they did not strip the decimus uh, in less than one year of age, and they found that the dissect donor uh, attached, although in four out of the six eyes, rebubbling was necessary. And so this is, again, something that can be considered that if you're doing a, a, a procedure, there, uh, there was another paper from uh, LV Prasad Institute where they looked at and dissect, and they found that which was uh, quite favorable for management of CHED. Uh, looking at another uh, nice paper from uh, uh, same from Dr. Ramapa and the group is that they looked at a retrospective study looking at the, all the poly posterior polymorphous dystrophy. Uh, usually, uh, the mean age of presentation is much higher. You know, it's about 32.5 years, and with a slight male preponderance, and mostly they have a bilateral involvement. You can have, again, the in terms of the presentation, most common are the vesicles in the band. Edema is only about a short, uh, about a smaller percentage, about 20%, you can say, and uh, with anterior segment changes, again, in one eye. And all, out of the 16 eyes, they have done penetrating keratoplasty and decimus stripping uh, endothelial keratoplasty in equal uh, numbers, and they found that all the graphs remain clear till last follow-up. So patients who have diffuse, have visually significant corneal edema may require keratoplasty and this seems to be a good option for such cases. This is a recent paper published last year where uh, Dr. Rootman's group, they tried performing an endothelial DMAC in a patient with posterior polymorphous dystrophy and they were not successful. And this patient uh, 
despite rebubbling, it did not stick. So they had to go back and do a dissect. And after doing the dissect, the visual acuity improved to 2070 and 2060 with good endothelial cell count. Now, let me share uh, uh, some of my, uh, two of my recent cases that I did. These were brothers and sisters. This is the brother's eye where you can see there is a diffuse bilateral corneal edema. And uh, so let me just go to his next slide. Yeah, so his clinical data is that his pre-op uncorrected vision was three by 60 and with best spectacle corrected minus four with minus three. The vision improved to 624. He had normal intraocular pressure. So we decided to go ahead and do a, uh, a DMEC in this case. So you can see that that's the eye. That's an eight millimeter mark I'm making. So the corneal diameter is slightly reduced. The eight millimeter mark is almost going up to the limbus. Removal of the epithelium, the edematous epithelium did improve the visualization. We did an inferior vertical paracentesis and pulled out the iris and did a generous inferior PI. And then we made two paracentesis at about seven o'clock and 12 o'clock position. And then we went ahead with a temporal clear corneal incision about three millimeter. That's a 2.8 keratome and we just enlarged the size a little bit. We did not attempt to remove the decimates. Uh, and since we had instilled some cohesive viscoelastic into the eye and pilocarpine, we did uh, remove that. That's the donor tissue, the DMEC donor that's prepared and marked. It's loaded onto the glass injector. We did use an AC maintainer to keep the chamber formed. And we went ahead with the glass injector, uh, the tip crossing the pupil. So we didn't want the decimal scroll to go try and make its way behind the pupil. And that's the insertion of the donor. We removed the AC maintainer after that. And then we closed the wound. And when we were inserting, we tried to insert in an orientation that the opener on the scroll is facing upwards. So now you can see that we did get our scroll in the right orientation, so we didn't have to you know, manipulate it too much to try and uh, you know, flip it over or something like that. And by gentle tapping of the surface, using two candlers, we were able to open the uh, graft. And at the end of it, we placed 20% uh, SF6 into the eye, that's the mark that we had made, the F-SPAM that we had created. So instead of using air, knowing that uh, these in these eyes, the tamponade may be required for a longer period of time. And since we have not stripped the decimals, we know that a, d a donor DM sticks better to the bare stroma than to the post uh, decimus membrane. We, we place SF6 complete fill, and then we put a bandage contact lens on the eye. That's how the patient looked at one month post-op, and you can see that the cornea looks much clearer than what it looked preoperatively, and his visual acuity in the post-op uh, with best spectacle corrected of minus four with minus five cylinder, possibly because of the suture that we placed temporarily, his visual acuity improved to 612. His specular count was 2,247 cells per millimeter square, and the pachymetry, if you see preoperatively, was 864 microns, and postoperatively, that had reduced to 539 microns. So there was a good resolution of the corneal edema. That's his sister who was six years old, and she had, in addition to the corneal edema, she had bilateral band-shaped keratopathy, and possibly because of the chronic edema that she had. That's her similar surgery was performed. That's her post-op uh, appearance. She was a little less cooperative for taking photographs, and uh, she did have a little bit of nystagmus, possibly because of the band-shaped keratopathy and the much reduced visual acuity that she had. So her visual acuity from pre-op of six by, uh, three by 60, the visual like best spectacle corrected visual acuity did improve to 624, a specular count of 1,876. And e even in her case, her pachymetry from 872 improved to 553. So there was good resolution of corneal edema. So endothelial keratoplasty seems to have several advantages compared to penetrating keratoplasty in managing pediatric corneal edema. Dissect or dissect, can be performed successfully. Removal of host DM may not be necessary in these eyes. An attempt to try and remove the host DM can sometimes make your inner surface very irregular. DMEC using uh, gas tamponade with either SF6 or C3FA non-expensile mixture can be attempted, although surgically challenging when compared to DSEC. Thank you. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Pogla. That is very encouraging because uh, one would idea. Can you just stay back? I, I have a question for you. Um, because ideally one would only want to change the endothelium in these patients and not add stroma to an already thick cornea. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I just want to ask you, why do you think that your uh, DMEC worked and not Rootman's? Is it the SF6 that made the difference? Maybe the age, because he attempted it in a four-month infant. Okay. And I did it at one of the child was eight years, the other one was six years. So maybe the anatomical dimensions of the eye, what I was dealing with, may be much uh, larger than compared to four months. Four months, the chamber would be, a chamber maintenance would have been very, very difficult because even if you use an AC maintainer, the chamber tends to collapse, the elasticity, elasticity is more. So I think it's the age that makes a difference. So maybe if I had to do it in a sub one year, like uh, an infant, maybe a disc would be a better option, maybe an ultra thin disc. But if I have any child that more than one year or two years, maybe I think because the volume is more, maybe DMEC can be attempted. Another and I think this one I did, I, as I dis- discussing in the morning, that now I started doing the pull through DMEC. So maybe I would, uh, instead of doing a, a DMEC where I just inject the donor, maybe I can even use a pull through donor, which would be even much more controlled and would, would, would work better in this situation. One more question. We know that traditionally, if you have in a DMEC, if you have the host DM, uh, that, that's the area which tends to detach and Correct. sometimes. In this, you're not at all removing the dismiss. So uh, yeah, how come that's it's not an, That's not an yeah. absolute rule. Yeah. The incidence of detachments are higher, but doesn't mean that each and every case will detach. So anticipating that it may detach, that's why I use a non-expansile mixture of SF6 or 6 3 fh so that my gas tamponade will last longer. The only problem I foresee using right. gas and all these things is whether I, these will intu- induce any lenticular changes yeah. in the child's eye by retaining the gas for a longer period of time. So it, it's kind of a you have to choose between the two and see, you know, that. And also intraoperatively, it's important to keep the pupil myos whenever you're doing any intraocular manipulation because the chamber tends to collapse. You repeatedly put your instruments into the eye. So, you know, a chance of having a lenticular touch and, you know, creating a cataract and all these uh, risk factors. Murli, do you have any comments? You do a lot, lot of endothelial keratoplasty for, and I think you have some of the biggest literature in this Yeah, they have, they have quite a good series on yeah. both in Chad and so posterior polymer. W- would you consider doing a DMEC in these cases? And um, what are your thoughts? Uh, done in a CHE. Stuff actually facilitated a, st- a sticky surface. And secondly, as even Dr. Pogla mentioned, in a pedi- <coughs> uh, David Rootman's case, you know, the corneum must have been much steeper than what yes. case we see as attempted eight-year-old. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, it's a worthy option. So I think maybe we can consider DMEC in a PPMD too. Yeah. We'll move on to the last talk. Uh, Dr. Sangwan was uh, sup- from LV Prasad was supposed to be giving this, but uh, he, he dropped out uh, because of some reason. So. Vinay was kind enough to take it up at last minute and I'd like to thank him for it. It's on a very important topic, ocular surface surgery in pediatric eyes. We know that many of these children have chemical injuries and (coughs) they have episodes of Steven Johnson and that sometimes is a problem. Let's see what Vinay has to say. Uh, Good afternoon again. Yes, ocular surface surgeries coming back to you know the surface from the anterior chamber uh, uh, is probably you know required in many of the pediatric cases which we see in OPDs. So it might be required during an acute event or as a tectonic procedure or chronic sequelae to one of the problems that happens to the eye. Now most you know common diseases which we come across in kids are thermal or chemical injuries. Then Stephen Johnson's a quite significant number of them, and VKCs. Though VKC is common, uh, you know, a condition which requires surgical intervention is not that common. <coughs> so coming to chemical, in acute stage, the aim of intervention or surgical intervention here is to, or even medical management is to control the inflammation, reduce the scarring response, and obtain as normal a healing response as possible. And you may have to, you know, do multiple repeated procedures in this situation to achieve an optimal outcome. Uh, Look for any necrotic tissue in the acute stage because these uh, necrotic tissues incite inflammation, perpetuate it and, you know, keeps on the inflammation going on. 
So that is the first uh, 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 thing to do in this. The next step is to look for the retained particles of the chemical. This is something which we, many of us, you know, forget to do or just avoid because these children are in severe pain, very uncooperative. We try to, you know, retract the lids. They don't let and uh, they don't allow you. So probably we tend to, you know, take it lightly, start medical management and think, okay, we'll do something so sometime later. But no, these are medical emergencies. This has to be examined the, at the first visit. If it is not possible to do them in the OPD, please take them to OT. Do it under general anesthesia. Make sure you see the whole eye surface and there is nothing in the eye. That is mandatory. <clears throat> now, once you have you know, examined and found out a necrotic lesion or any chemical or particles, you, those have to come out. So if it is a very superficial burn, you know, just uh, debriding it with a cotton bud will peel off the uh, tissue, cut out all the, you know, avascular tissues till there is a smile bleeding and then cover the whole surface with an amniotic membrane. What I usually do is I tag it on along the lid margin with a suture, then glue the rest of the amniotic membrane onto the eye surface so that it actually drapes from the lid margin, posterior surface of the legs, fornix, bulbar conjunctiva, cornea, then to the other side. And finally, take the fornix suture so that the amniotic membrane stays up well opposed to the surface. <coughs> this is another procedure. T10 plus is another procedure which is, you know, uh, horribly under-recognized and very less utilized. When there is significant uh, limbal ischemia, this actually helps. <coughs> now the question is, when should we do it? Should it, should it be done at the first sitting or the immediately if the patient comes with severe ischemia? Would you do it or not? Slightly controversial. What I generally do is I don't do a TNN plasty on the first sitting. First sitting, if it is required, you do an amniotic membrane, do a thorough debridement and all, and see how the eye heals. In about five to 10 days, you know, there will be revascularization and the exact area of dense ischemia is clearly delimited. That is the time when we really go in and do the TNN plasty. <coughs> Now, if there is a frank perforation, tissue adhesive comes to the rescue. If there is a corneal melt, lamellar or penetrating keratoplasty, extensive melt, you may need to have a large therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. In acute states, the outcome of these procedures are not great, but then these are globe-saving procedures, and what we are concerned here is to save the globe and not to really restore the vision at this stage of the uh, disease process. Now, in chronic stage, when there is a lot of scarring, uh, simply fed off, and all the, the management decision or how you proceed is stage-wise. The first step here is to reconstruct the lid and the fornix. Uh, like uh, shown here, if there is a dense, you know, uh, attention, you release it, reform the fornix with amniotic membrane. You may even have to use a buccal mucous membrane to form the fornix and the lids properly. Once the ocular surface is well formed, then Know, try to address the limbus and finally the corneal transplant so the limbus the, this this used to be the algorithm of management conjunctival limbal graph which can be either autograph from the other eye or from the life later keratolimbal x vivo culture <coughs> so again before any sort of limbal reconstruction the first step is to remove the whole panel from the surface this is actually an old video it is now very clearly shown in the literature that the combined corneal transplant with the limbal reconstruction is not a good way to go ahead. This is our autograph taken. You can either take six clockers from one side or three, three. If it is a six clockers, you split it into two and put it on both sides and then secure it. Keratolimbal allografts, well, con uh, it's practically not practiced nowadays, uh, but this is how you dissect the graft after punching the donor button fixed on to a uh, processes and then do a dissection to get the, you know, the limbus. This is the PK done and this is the limbal graft which is staying there. These videos are actually about, you know, 12 years old. <coughs> I mean, pro mo most of us doesn't do this procedure anymore because of the problem is here you have to immunosuppress the patient systemically and all the, uh, you know, uh, problems with immunosuppression the expense, the complications, uh, uh, the
the compliance, all those issues are there. Then came the era of cultivated limbal epithelial cells. Uh, a small biopsy, about two, two to three millimeter of the limbal biopsy is taken. So this is the limbus which is taken. <coughs> Once the limbus is separated, it is uh, chopped into multiple small pieces, put an amniotic membrane, and it's cultured. So that you get a, a monolayer expand on the uh, 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 amniotic membrane. Then the second stage, you go to the you know a damaged dye. Uh, again, uh, the first step, like any, any, any procedure here, is to remove the pannus from the surface. And then uh, the amniotic membrane uh, with the cultured cells is gently placed onto the surface and secured, secured either with sutures or if whenever possible with fibrin glue. <laughs> About you know 70 percent success in in two years. Then came the you know the simple limbal epithelial transplant or SLET as has been named. Uh, the problem with CLET is it is expensive, in expensive and time consuming. Expensive because you need a lab where you have to take the limbers and culture it and time consuming because it's a two-step procedure. Uh, first culture, then about 10, 15 days, once you get the culture, you do the other eye. In SLET, it's a single step procedure. Actually, the eye acts as the lab for the <coughs> transplant. The first step here is to remove the panels, then harvest the limbers from the other eye, fix the amniotic membrane first, glue it nicely, then try to uh, uh, you know, take the limbal uh, biopsy, cut it into multiple small pieces, spread it onto the surface in a circular manner, try to avoid the central area, fix it with uh, fibrin glue, put a bandage contact lens. Very simple procedure and highly successful. Uh, these are some of the, you know, mm, pre and post uh, pictures. Now, the advantage here is it's especially useful in children. While the success rate in both CLET and SLET in adults is almost the same, in children, there is a huge difference in uh, the success rate. Let far, far superior to you know cultured cells. So, let actually effectively restores the normal corneal structures, improves the visual acuity, works reliably well in children and adults, and better affordable alternatives. The next problem which we face is Steven Johnson syndrome can be devastating. Acute stage. This is one stage where many of us ophthalmologists doesn't come across and people who are in multi-speciality, you know, hospitals have the advantage of seeing these patients. And it is at this stage where we can make a real difference in the life of these patients. And it has been shown that, you know, amniotic membrane grafting at this stage has been, you know, able to prevent or mitigate the devastating and blinding complications of SGS that can occur in the chronic stage. Now, how it is done, uh, it's not a very, very, very complicated surgical procedure at all. Remove any of the membranes or pseudomembranes on the surface. Again, uh, like what I showed in the chemical injury video, the idea here is the whole eye from the lid margin to the lid margin has to be draped with the amniotic membrane. So once the, you know, all the debris, the, uh, the, uh, the, the pseudomembrane, everything is peeled off, the amniotic membrane is placed and is secured to the lid margin with sutured. Then you can glue it onto the lids and the bulbar surface with the fibrin glue. After that, you can either take a phonics forming suture. If it is difficult, you can in fact form a small uh, ring with the IV tubing and push it into the phonics so that it stretches and actually keeps the membrane opposed onto the phonics. Such a simple procedure and actually can prevent development of these kind of complications later. The chronic stage, this is the culprit that causes most of the problems because of the mechanical and uh, secondary inflammation. Again, in our, in our setup, the, this is the buccal mucous membrane transplantation for the lead margin keratinization is the most effective one. Peel off the you know, the keratinized tissue from the lid margin. What is important here is care should be taken not to damage the tarsus. The mucosa is harvested. Uh, 
to send out as much as possible. You don't need that bulky mucosa. You need a very thin layer of the mucosa here. Secure to the lead margin with uh, suture, trim to the defect size, and it is glued <coughs> to the surface. Now this is, if you can see this eye, this is actually dry keratinized eye. This eye, patient is seeing, he has vision here, some moisture, this is after, you know, post MMG. So the rationale here is the lid, the mucosa provides a smooth surface, which reduces the microtrauma and uh, inflammation, which improves significantly, improves the patient comfort, reduces the photophobia. And to a certain extent, it improves the, uh, you know, vegetability of the eye. So this is a very good article, which is, which is still in the press coming up and they have actually shown how to manage, you know, chronic sequelae in children. And it is interesting to note that this is how they conclude. In children with chronic ocular sequelae, conservative therapy has got absolutely no role in the long-term treatment. It is a surgical uh, uh, condition where MMG in our setup, pros lenses are nothing other than scleral lenses, uh, is very effective. The pros, the problem, or scleral lenses, the problem in our setup is it's highly expensive and many, very difficult for these patients to maintain them. Then comes the VKC. As you know, limbal form, you have the large papillae. The mainstay of treatment here is medical to get the uh, you know, inflammation under control. Surgically, you have to intervene when there is a shield ulcer. Grade one and grade two, probably no, but then when there is an elevated plaque, you have to intervene surgically, peel off the, uh, you know, the plaque and amniotic membrane does really help in healing them faster with minimal scarring. And when you have such large papillae, does, uh, does, I mean, does a surgical intervention is really needed. It is needed when you have controlled the inflammation, but you're, you know, uh, the, you're fa you fail to control the epithelopathy. That is when you decide to intervene them surgically Cryo is one of the uh, way of doing it, but then that doesn't really help. Then excision alone doesn't help. There will be recurrence. Excision with amniotic membrane doesn't help. There will be recurrence. Excision with conjunctival, bulba conjunctival transplantation also doesn't help. There will be recurrence. The only one which we have found to be u of any use is, you know, buccal mucous membrane transplant. XI said, again, now lip mucosa, very thin layer glue it onto the surface, it does prevent recurrence. In fact, if recurrence occurs, it occurs at the edges. It doesn't occur on the, onto the area where you have transplanted. So this is one useful area, I mean, useful technique in these cases. And in end-stage VKC, when there is limbal deficiency, which is usually bilateral, that is when you have to think about other options like alloslet. In these desperate, you know, situation, probably you have to think because, think of doing this because any allo transplant means systemic immunosuppression with its own problems. Then another controversial area is pediatric keratoprosthesis. Not a big fan of it. I, I believe, you know, pediatric keratoprosthesis is a philosophical decision rather than a, 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 a scientific uh, decision because keratoprosthesis will have problems. So you have to decide whether you should be, you know, the person taking the decision to induce those problems in these children's life. But then, yes, very selected cases that have been very good results. Uh, like this, this is a failed graph for Peters, had undergone, you know, um, uh, uh, Boston Capro type one. So I think with that, I'll stop now. And thank you once more, Rishi, for all the, you know, Th talks. Thank you, Vinay. Vinay, you covered a lot of things and uh, all of those are difficult situations to deal with in pediatric eyes. Are there any questions for any of the speakers? I'd like to, yeah, can we have the lights on, please? Any questions from any of the panelists? So I'd like to thank the audience for a patient hearing. Yeah, there's a question from Dr. Fogla for Dr. F Sooth. So when you do pediatric keratoplasties and you have associated glaucoma, what would be the, again, same trabeculectomy and trabeculotomy would be the best option or? Because that again is a very challenging situation. Often you get patients like Peter's anomaly or something, and then you do a, uh, you know. Uh so when we're talking in terms of uh, uh, 
uh, Peters or normally we would prefer to do a preparatory trap with mitomycin with releasable suture and then have you do that because the possibility of a rise in intraocular pressure is as high as 50 percent. So we would prefer to. How do you assess the pressure in uh, has to be an examination under anesthesia if they don't allow it. But sometimes uh, there's a new instrument called the transpalpable tonometer. So if you've got the technique right, it works very well in children. But again, cooperation is the limitation. What do you do for your pediatric? I care. So you, do you get glaucoma procedures done for all pediatric PKs before or? Uh, Particular Nasser said Peter sclerocarnia. They have a s almost 50% risk. Accent will trigger almost 70% of them. So if the pressures were high, so we have to get them trapped and control the IOP and go about it. Long after the we, we wait about 12 weeks time. So that's a very important key measure here, 12 weeks time. The reason is once you do trap, their aqueous will never be the normal. So we've done uh, some proteomic studies. They have a thick protein following a trabeculectomy. Yeah. is based on the profile of practice. I will not see a primary Peters syndrome. I will see a Peters referred for a glaucoma opinia. Whether a that they'll say that we are planning a, a PK, would a, uh, do you want to do a trap first? So then we would take a call. If, if, if likewise we would get a patient first, then we would say preparatory trap with PK plan. I'd like to thank everybody, the speakers and the audience. Uh, I think all of us learned something. Thank you.